good evening, everyone. It is uh, great to be able to offer you uh, a really warm welcome uh, to Great Vic this evening for our evening service as we come uh, and worship the Lord together as we uh, gather around his word and then later on this evening as we also uh, come to gather around the Lord's table together as well. Um, a quick heads up that this evening, if you weren't with us uh, this morning, you might not be aware that Steve, our pastor, sadly tested, COVID, uh, tested positive for COVID this morning. Um, so we've been doing a little bit of juggling around. Um, so if you are here this evening hoping uh, to get the next in- installment from Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, that happened this morning. So you're going to have to um, maybe jump onto Sermon Audio or our, our website uh, where you can find that. We are very thankful tonight to have... Um, Adam Riley stepping in to preach for us uh, from Psalm 13. So um, thank you very much, Adam, for for being willing to do that for us. And we'll look forward to to hearing from God's word together in that later on. Uh, Thankfully, Steve, by the way, seems to be doing okay. Um, Hopefully he and the family will be able to get back out uh, sometime soon. In terms of announcements this evening, uh, hopefully you got a bulletin. Um, There's not much for me really to say there other than just a reminder again that this Wednesday is our small groups. Um, So there won't be a meeting down here at the church. That will be in the various homes that those small groups are meeting in. The other announcement that I've got here is not on the bulletin, but it is really good news. Good news that I forgot to mention this morning, um, but good news that uh, as of Thursday, Paddy and Charlotte are now engaged. So we are... um, Uh, We are delighted for them. Congratulations to both of you. Um, Enjoy the next weeks uh, as you uh, plan things together as well. Um, I saw people stealing a look at Charlotte's ring earlier. I'm sure she'll happily show that off later. Uh, And you can go and get the full story as well from them. Well, uh, as we turn to worship the Lord together now, uh, why don't we pray together? Let's uh, pray for Paddy and Charlotte and also ask for the Lord's help and blessing as we meet together. Our heavenly Father, thank you so much for this good news of Paddy and Charlotte's engagement. Lord, thank you for your work in their lives. Lord, thank you for their passion for serving you. And Lord, thank you for the love that you've given them for each other as well. Lord, please bless them and help them in this exciting next few months as they get plans together for a wedding and then for a life together after that. Lord, please bless them, help them, help them to enjoy these moments. And Lord, help them to keep looking to you. And Lord, as they look to you, we ask now that you would help us to look to you as well as we come to worship you together now. Lord, please be with us. Uh, Please speak to us. Please help us to have hearts and minds that are focused and ready to hear from your word. Lord, that you would do your work among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in uh, Psalm Chapter 8, Psalm 8, verse 1, we have a glorious proclamation. And this is how David opens the psalm. He says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And as we begin our service now, as we continue that together, we're going to pick up that proclamation And sing similarly ourselves of the majesty and greatness of our God. In the words of our opening song, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand and sing together as the musicians begin to play.
a seat again. And let's pray to our Heavenly Father together now. Lord our God, you truly are a great God. Lord, when we think of the works of your hands, Lord, the mountains, the streams, Lord, all of your creation, the animals, the birds, Lord, we are in awe. We can't even begin to imagine how you would create those things, and yet you spoke them into being. Lord, you truly are great. And Lord, you truly are great to us. You are so good to us. Lord, thank you that as we have just sung, you did not spare your son, but you sent him to die for us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to remember that again together this evening. Lord, we rejoice in you and we praise you. And Lord, as we meet together this evening here, we think of those who can't be meeting like this this evening. Lord, we think of those around the world, your church, who cannot meet together for fear of persecution, arrest, or even the threat of death. Lord, please would you sustain your church all around the world this evening. Please would you give them hope and comfort and endurance to run the race, holding fast to Christ to the end. Lord, we think of your church in Ukraine this evening. Lord, thank you that you have a people there who are trusting in you. Lord, please would you encourage them this evening. Please would you be with those who have had to leave loved ones behind or who have been left behind. Lord, we thank you for that glorious truth that you never leave us or forsake us. Please, with your church, your believers in Ukraine, would they know that truth deep within them this evening? Lord, we're aware of people even within our own fellowship here who can't be with us this evening as well. Lord, please, would you give them strength and help and encouragement. Lord, those who are sick, please provide for them. Give them relief from pain and suffering. And Lord, we think also this evening of James and Audrey McKeown grieving the loss of James's mother today. Lord, please be with them as well, and please be with all of their family. Lord, as we think of that, we are reminded again of that great news of the gospel that means that death is not the end. Lord, thank you so much that Christ came and he has had victory over the grave. Lord, please, with James and Audrey and their family, take great comfort and hope in that today. And Lord, please, would you give us great comfort and hope in that this evening as well. So Lord, we commit all of these people to you and we commit ourselves to you as well. And as we now turn to read your word and consider it together, please would you be at work in our hearts. Please would you do your work of making us more and more holy. And please be at work to hold us fast to you through your word this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are going to uh, read together now, and we're going to uh, be reading from Psalm 13. Um, so please do open that up if you've got a Bible with you. Um, and Adam's going to be speaking to us shortly from this passage. Psalm 13. To the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? 
how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Well, before um, Adam comes to speak to us from that passage, we're going to sing again uh, two songs now that pick up uh, on the Lord's steadfast love towards us and the salvation that he offers us in Christ. We're going to stand and sing together in Christ alone and he will hold me fast. Let's stand and continue to worship the Lord.
your seat again and let's pray together now just as Adam comes to preach for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these great truths that we have just been singing. And Lord, thank you so much for the great truths that are contained within your word. Lord, thank you for the riches of your word. And Lord, please would you speak to us from your word this evening. Lord, please would you give us hearts that are open, that are attentive to what you would say to us this evening. Thank you that you know each of our situations. And Lord, so we pr please pray that you would speak into each of our lives as Adam comes to speak to us now. Lord, please give him boldness and courage as well as he brings your word to us. Lord, open our hearts and do your work amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Adam. Well, good evening, folks. Uh, if we could take our Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 13. There's a story told about a man who fell in a hole. Mike fell in a hole. He was trapped. There was no way out of the hole. And as he was trapped in the hole, a politician walked by. And Mike cried out, help, I'm stuck in a hole. The politician looked down and said, it's okay. I'll write you a law. You'll be out by the end of the week. And he walked on. A few minutes later, a pastor walked by and Mike shouted, Help! I'm stuck in a hole. The pastor looked down and said, It's okay. I'll write you a sermon and a prayer. And he walked on. A few minutes later, Mike, at this stage beginning to worry, looks up and he notices his friend. And shouts, help, I'm stuck in a hole. The friend looks down at the hole, sees Mike, and he jumps in. Mike goes, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck in the hole. The friend looks at Mike and says, it's okay. I've been here before. I know the way out. In some respects, Psalm 13 shows us David. And David's been in the hole. And David shows us the way out of the hole. Because Psalm 13 deals with despair. It shows us how we traverse life's difficulties. It shows us how we deal with despair. Look at the initial opening of the psalm. For the choir director, a psalm of David. These words reveal to us that what, what follows is David's experience. What follows is an experience of a saint, of a man after God's own heart. What it tells us is every single Christian, every single saint, every single son and daughter of God will face hardship. We'll face difficulty, we'll face testing, we'll face trial, we'll face temptation. We're not exempt from difficulties. This is David, who had been promised the kingship of Israel. This is David who had killed Goliath. This is David who God knew intimately. And yet in the psalm, he's crying out for deliverance. In this psalm, he's crying out for help. In this psalm, he's crying out in pain and despair. Well, these words tell us that all God's people will face difficulty. But this psalm also tells us how to face that difficulty, how to deal with that difficulty. And notice as well the mercy of God in giving us this psalm. As I said, this is an experience of David. And 
we wonder why does David go through this difficulty? We're not told as to the exact circumstances or the exact context as to what's happening. It's suspected that David's being pursued by Saul. But why go through this? Why cause this to come upon David? Well, numerous reasons, but primarily it causes David to pray. The whole of the psalm is a prayer to God, a cry for deliverance, a, a cry from David's innermost soul. God, help. God, would you work? God, would you deliver me? We see the mercy of God in this psalm in teaching us how to deal with despair. So, look at verses 1 and 2 with me and this is our first point I want us to notice David's pain verse 1 how long O Lord will you forget me forever how long will you hide your face from me how long shall I take counsel in my soul having sorrow in my heart all the day how long will my enemy be exalted over me David opens with a, a litany, a list of questions, one after another. He's beating the same rhythm. Lord, why is this happening? Lord, why is this happening? Lord, why is this happening? We can almost see David's sorrow, his sadness, his desperation is in view here. And he begins by asking God, will you forget me? Notice what he calls God, Lord, covenant-keeping God, the God of his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God who was with him when he fought Goliath, the God who was with him when he went and fought the Philistines. David addresses this God and says, will you forget me? It's a rhetorical question. David knows the answer is no, but he is in such despair at this point that he feels God has abandoned him. And Christian, you and I may face difficulty, but we know God never abandons his saints. Isaiah 49 tells us that God has inscribed all his people's names upon the palms of his hand. Think, think of your own day-to-day -day life. What, what part of your body do you see the most? Your hands. Your palms. In telling us this, Isaiah is using evocative image, imagery. He's telling us that God knows us intimately, that we are in the palm of God's hand to the point that he will never forsake us, he will never leave us, he will never forget us. And yet David in this psalm tells us Lord, I feel as if you've forgotten me. Lord, I feel as if I'm on my own. Lord, I, I feel as if you no longer know me. Christian, have you ever felt the same? Non-Christian, have you ever felt the same? For the Christian, there is hope. God knows his own. John 10, we're told that God knows the sheep. In fact, God calls the sheep and he calls them by name. No, he will not forget his own. But David also queries, God, how long will you hide your face from me? Throughout scripture, we read that this, this idea of God's face, uh, it symbolizes favor. The, the ironic blessing, I'll not sing it, but uh, the Lord shine his face and his countenance upon his people. It's a sign of favor. And David fears that he has fallen out of favor with God. That somehow something has happened along the way and David has finally went a step too far. God has finally cast him off. And that he's no longer... A child no longer loved, no longer cherished by God. And he cries out, God, will you hide your face from me? 
Will you, will you no longer favor me? Will you no longer love me? Lord, why is all this happening? Have I lost favor with you? Again, for the Christian, we know God will never leave his children. That God delights in his children. That God sings over his children. That we are the apple of God's eye. That God so loved us that he sent his only son into the world. That he would become sin so that we might inherit the righteousness of God. No, when those doubts, when those fears, when those feelings of despondency come, we recall that God loves me. It's like the the simple truth of that children's hymn. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible told me so. So David cries out, how long will you hide your face from me? Have I fallen out of favor with you, God? In verse 2, he he moves on saying, How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? David has replayed the events over and over and over again to the point where he has talked to himself, he has isolated himself, he has recalled the events, everything that has led up, the things that he could have done, the things that he should have done, the things that he would do. And David has been led to a place of despair and despondency. Notice what he says, I have sorrow in my heart all the day. This is a man broken by his difficulties. This is a man who is at his wit's end. This is a man who can no longer take the the difficulties and the sorrows. He feels completely abandoned by God. And he ends verse 2 by saying, How long will my enemy be exalted over me? As I said, we don't know the exact circumstances behind the psalm. It's thought that Saul is pursuing David at this point. You may recall the story of David and Saul. Saul growing jealous of David's popularity. Saul being the king realizes that David is growing in popularity among the public. And that David could potentially usurp the throne and take over the throne. Saul, in a, in a fit of jealousy, tries to kill David, and so the hunt begins. David flees, and for almost seven to twelve years, David is hunted by Saul. They were once friends. In fact, they are family. And David says, how long will this enemy be exalted over me? Some commentators, in fact, believe that the enemy is actually death itself. Regardless of the position we take, David is crying out that there is an enemy pursuing him constantly, like a dog at his heels. And that it is pursuing closer and closer and closer, and he's had enough. And Christian, we don't have a soul in our life. But we have our enemies. Death has been defeated by Christ. We we cry out, death, where is thy sting? At the cross, death has been defeated, but we still have our enemies. Scripture tells us that we fight against the flesh, that we fight against the world, that we fight against the devil, that Satan is a prowling lion waiting to devour. Oh, we have our enemies and we are brought into certain situations, certain difficulties, certain paths. And we cry out like David, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? We look at situations and we see no way out. We see no light at the end of the tunnel. We wonder how will we possibly get through? We each can identify with David. He's at the bottom of the hole and he sees no way out. 
But look at verses 3 and 4. We see David's attitude changes somewhat. He moves from his pain to a prayer. Verse 3. Look and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy says I have overcome him, and my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. Verse 3 opens with, look and answer me, O Lord my God. Seems quite brash. Who would dare cry out to God like this? Look and answer me, God. And yet we, we must remember who this is speaking. This is David, a child of God. This is David who knows with full assurance that he can come before God without fear. That he can come before God with confidence. That he can come before God with assurance. That he can come before God with boldness. And in that desperation, he simply cries out to God. We see this man's inner soul. We see this man pouring out his innermost being. Crying out to God, Lord, look and answer me. William Gouge, a Puritan in the 17th century, he defined prayer as simply pouring out the soul before God. Not coming with pretense, not coming with perfect words, not coming with transcripts, not coming with a shopping list, but simply coming with broken words, with broken hearts, and putting them at the feet of Jesus. That's what David's doing. Christians, when God's providence leads us into difficulty, when they sweep us off our feet and they push us to our knees, stay there and pray to God. When our difficulties make us bow and when our difficulties keep our head low, keep it there. And pray to God. We come not with fancy words. We don't come with fanciful ideas. No, we come like David. Oh Lord, answer me. We see the man's desperation. And look at again who he addresses. The Lord, my God. He calls out to his God. Not to his ancestors' God. Not to a friend's God. Not to a pagan God. But to the covenant God that he knows intimately. Once again, Christian, we have a father. We have a friend. We have a God who puts his ear to the ground, commanding us, calling us, cherishing us to pray. In our difficulties, in our desperation, in our despondency, call out to him. David prays and says, give light to my eyes, O Lord, lest I sleep the sleep of death. In that First petition, give light to my eyes. David is asking for understanding. He's asking God, help me to understand the situation. Help me to have wisdom to discern the path that you would have me take. Help me to walk according to your statutes. You know, we don't understand why certain things happen. We'd like to. Why is Russia invading Ukraine? I don't know. Why is the Lord allowing it to happen? I don't know. But I know God is sovereign. I know God is good. I know God is just. I know God is holy. I know he will make all things right in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what David's looking for. 
wisdom, to look beyond his situation, to look beyond his difficulties, to be able to understand and discern that there is something going on beyond his mortal comprehension, beyond his mortal understanding, that God is indeed at work. You see, David has been promised the kingdom of Israel. And if Saul is pursuing him doggedly at his heels, seeking his life, how can God possibly be faithful to his promise? How can David rule if David is dead? And yet God seems so far away. God seems as if he's not acting. God seems to be almost unfaithful to his promise. God, why are you doing this? And so he asks, help me to understand. Help me to see. Help me to discern. Help me to be faithful in the fire. I'm reminded of Daniel and his three friends. And the three friends, they're told to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar. And the three friends, they refuse to do so. Nebuchadnezzar in a fit of rage says, threw them into the fire, threw them into the furnace. In fact, heated up to a point where even the guards who approach will be killed. The three friends that are thrown into the fire. They had faith. They had faith that God would hear. They, they didn't understand everything. They didn't understand the intricacies of what God was doing in that moment, but they had faith. David prays for this kind of faith. Lord, help me to see. I don't understand, but help me to see. Likewise, Christians, do we not need this prayer? Sickness hits. Lord, why? A bereavement comes suddenly, Lord, why? A job loss, Lord, why? A car breaks down, Lord, why? From the minuscule to the macro level, Lord, why? Lord, would you give us eyes to see? And this idea of I sleep the sleep of death. David isn't afraid of dying. No, again, it's this imagery, it's this idea that David finally, fully is abandoned by God, that at, at long last, God has given up on this sinful, fallible, weak human being, that my, my enemies finally triumph over me. And again, we can, we can almost see ourselves in David's situation. Now, whatever our experience is, whatever difficulties we go through, we can almost go, Lord, is this the end? Have my enemies finally triumphed over me? Is this the last stop for me? It's too much. I can't go on. And then look at verse 4. David prays, give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have overcome him and my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. David is crying out, my enemies are hot on my heels. They are ready to pounce. I am surrounded by enemies. Lord, do something. Lord, intervene. Lord, work. Accomplish your will. Otherwise, I will die. Otherwise, my enemies will win. Otherwise, my adversaries will stand above me. They will mock. They will ridicule. They will rejoice that I am defeated. Lord, would you work? Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Victorian preacher, he had a, a book called Faith's Checkbook. The purpose of the small book was, the premise of the book, was essentially that Christians could take the promises of God, 
they could pull promises of God from Holy Scripture and they could take these promises like you would a check to a bank. You can take the promises to God and you can say, God, you have written, now accomplish. God, you have said in your word that you will do this. You either do it or you're a liar. This is what David is saying. God, you have promised me the kingdom. God, you anointed me. You told me I would be king. My enemies are pursuing me. My enemies are at my heel. Lord, do something. Otherwise, you're a liar. There isn't much I dare say reverence in this prayer. David is simply a man at his wit's end, crying out to God, no pretense, no polish. This is a man crying out for help. And Christian, have we not been there? A sin you've been struggling with Something that has been hounding you doggedly for year after year after year. It, it's so become almost a part of you. You fight and you fight and you fight. You gain a little ground and then the enemy comes back. You cry out, Lord, have you not said that you will equip us? So that we can fight against our sin. Lord have you not said that you will help us in our time of need. Lord have you not said. Do we not see ourselves in David's shoes. Do we not see the prayer that we should emulate and follow. Lord would you not work. So we have David's pain. We have David's prayer. Finally, in verses 5 through 6, we have David's praise. Throughout the sermon, I've used the word feel. David feels despondent. David feels abandoned. David feels alone. It was Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, said, I don't trust in emotions. Don't give me emotions. Give me the word. He's a more modern example. Alistair Begg, an American preacher with a Scottish accent. He was at a church. And the church began and the service began. And the pastor got up in the service that Begg was a part of. Pastor got up and said, how you all feel today? And Begg laments this. He cries out in, in his own sermon, and comment in this, he goes, don't tell me what you feel. Tell me what you know. Don't tell me what you feel. Tell me what you know. And this is what happens in verses 5 through 6. There's almost a, a shift, there's almost a, a change as David recalls God's salvation. You see, in verses 1 through 4, David has been lamenting the Lord's lack of presence. And now in verses 5 through 6, there's a, there's a change, there's a shift in gears, there's a switch that goes off. And David cries out to God going, but I will trust in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt bountifully with me. It's almost as if David realizes who he's praying to. It's almost as if David remembers who he's complaining to. It's almost as if David goes, this is God that I approach. This is God who has been with me when I fought with the lions who came from my sheep. This is God who was with me 
when I fought the giant and killed him with a sling and a stone. This is God who has been with me as I fled from Saul and have survived these many long years. This is God. And this is his salvation. This is God who has dealt bountifully with me. And Christian, we can say the same. I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. We've sang of it. Several songs in Christ alone my hope is found. We'll sing of it later when I survey the wondrous cross. For those of us who take part in communion, we will partake in that wonderful grace where we remember the Lord's salvation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That he went to the tree. There he died and bled for you and me. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In the salvation of God. I will sing to God. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, Take aside salvation for a moment. Think of your own life. Think of all the wonderful, glorious, good things God has poured out. A home. A family. Friends. A car. Food. As the old hymn, count your blessings one by one, see what the Lord has done. The Lord has dealt bountifully with us. You know, it's well said uh, that anything above ankle heights of mercy. I find it so revealing that in Northern Irish culture, the first question we ask one another is, how's things? Ah, not so bad. It's very revealing. Not so bad. In some small measure, you mean it could be better. But the Lord hasn't poured out enough grace. The Lord hasn't been bountiful enough. No, the Lord has dealt bountifully. Add in then salvation. Wonderful, glorious, good salvation. That Christ would come for rebel sinners. For enemies. That he would die our death. That he would take the cup. That he would drink it in full. That he would bear God's wrath. For guilty. Condemned. Undeserving sinners. Like you and me. This is who we cry out to. This is what we must remind ourselves of. When despair hits, when God's providence brings us into difficulties, when we are broken, needy, weak, we remind ourselves of the gospel. We sing to the Lord, for he has dealt bountifully with us. And for you who are not saved, The question simply is this. Who do you call out to? Friends are good, but they ultimately fail. Family is loving, kind, but ultimately they crumble. Health, wealth, prosperity, education, job, Everything life can offer will simply vanish and fade. Who do you call out to? How do you deal with your despair? David cried out to his God. Christian, we cry out to our God. Non-Christian, will you cry out to that God? I have trusted in your loving kindness.
My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray together to this God. Almighty and most glorious God, you are sovereign over all things. You bring the winds, the rain, the hail. You accomplish all things according to your purpose for your glory and for our good. Therefore, we are brought into difficulties. We are brought into hardship. We face trial and temptation all because of your almighty power. And Lord, it is easy to become despondent, worried, stressed in these situations. But we pray that we would have, a, have an attitude like David to simply pour out our heart, to not feel ashamed, but to simply say, Lord, would you work? And Lord, would you help us to ultimately look to Calvary, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and there see that you are indeed for us, that your righteous right hand holds us, that you delight over us, and that all things indeed work for our good and for your glory. Help us, O Lord, and bring glory to your name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Adam, for leading us through uh, God's word there and pointing us to Christ. And we are going to pick up in just a moment in the Lord's um, Supper that salvation that we've just been thinking about, that Christ um, offers to us, His bound, the Lord's bountiful um, dealing with us. Um, but as we prepare to come around the Lord's Supper, we're going to stand and sing the first two verses of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's stand and sing together. Take a seat again. 